I'm Rick Smith from Global Aquatic Research, and today I have with me Fionn Pereira. And uh, Fionn, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, what you've been up to? Yeah, so hi there. I'm Fionn, and I'm from the south of Ireland, so kind of a little bit remote and a little bit far away from maybe where you are. Um, but essentially, I'm a high, uh, just a post-high school student. I just finished high school, and I'm going to be going into university. Um, I've been enthusiastic about nature, about science, and just the world around me from a very young age. And because of that, um, I've been working on numerous projects for developing different things. So I love working around in my home lab and, yeah, just engaging with science, education, and innovation. Well, that's fantastic. And recently, um, you were brought to my attention. I saw you in the news a couple of weeks ago because you won the Google Science Fair. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. So uh, the Google Science Fair is a science fair where anybody can enter from anywhere around the world. It's an online science fair where you can just type up your project, enter it, and then they'll select different people. So I have done lots of science projects. Um, however, one of my most recent ones is one about removing microplastics from water. Basically, it's a new method to remove microplastics from water, which uses um, oil, vegetable oil, and magnetite powder, which is basically rough powder. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. But essentially, I, I entered this to the Google Science Fair, and I was selected as one of the top 20 finalists, one of the top 20 in the world, so to speak. And that was already a huge honor. And then we got to go to California. We got to talk to lots of inspirational judges, including Vince Cerf and, and quite um, cool people there. And from that, they selected their top winner, who happened to be my project with an investigation into the removal of microplastics from water using perfluids. Yeah, well, congratulations. And I couldn't think of a better project to actually have won that science fair, um, as I'm sure you're aware of. And some people watching this interview, we've got a serious problem currently with plastics in the ocean. And mm -hmm. it's not going anywhere. And we're going to need some new technologies to help us out along the way as well as uh, slowly weaning off plastics, in, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about, okay, so you essentially, you're, you've made plastics uh, magnetic in a sense where you can literally remove them with a magnet. Mm -hmm. So this has applications for removing them from wastewater streams? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so essentially the way my method works, it uses um, oil. I use used vegetable oil, so I can actually reuse old vegetable oil from, let's say, I don't know, McDonald's or somewhere like that. And I can also use magnetite powder, which is rust powder. And together they form a really cool liquid, one of my favorite liquids, and that's called ferrofluid. That liquid is magnetic, which means that if I bring a magnet close to it, the liquid will be attracted. And I identified that this liquid would actually attract plastics if I put it into water. And that's because plastics are non-polar and this liquid is non-polar. I just learned about this in high school chemistry and I thought maybe I could apply this polarity thing to plastics in the water. So um, essentially, yes, I think it could be used to remove microplastics from wastewater streams, but I think one could also implement it in the wa water intake system of let's say big ships. And like that, as a byproduct of shipping, one could actually be filtering oceanic water as well. That's a, that's a very interesting idea. Uh, <laughs> since they're already crossing, right, and they're going to be traveling past large amounts of microplastics on their way, uh, mm -hmm. so they might as well be filtering while they're already intaking this water. Yeah. Yeah, fan, fantastic idea. So you stumbled across this technology because you had an interest in these types of materials. Uh, once you started looking to see if this had an application towards removing plastics, what was that experimental method that you went through? What did you have to tweak uh, to get this to work, or did it just work right off the bat? Well, uh, there's no real method for removing my plastics from water except for filtration at the moment, which is carbon filtration. That's really difficult because it takes ages, it takes weeks to delete the water, so it's really not viable. So I was actually walking along the seashore um, near where I live here in Ireland, and I found a rock on our seashore, and that had oil spill residue on it. And stuck to that oil spill residue were plastics. And that kind of sparked my interest. So I was like, why is there some plastic sticking to some oil spill residue? And that's when I learned about the polarity. So my first tests included different types of oil. I used vegetable oil, I used olive oil, I used different types of oil. And I found that light oil seemed to work best. And then I thought, well, maybe I can expand on this and turn an oil into my favorite liquid, and that's ferrofluid, because I had the idea, well, magnets would work. So I did loads and loads of tests, and some didn't work. 
um, some did, and then I kind of refined my method um, to then the testing method that I decided on, and then I just tested that 2,000 times to see if it, it would work or not. <laughs> so when you think about um, scaling this up so it can be used on in the intake system of ships, or it can be used in wastewater treatment plants, um, what are some of the considerations with that? I know that to deal with this global problem of plastics, one, thing's, one thing we need to think about is how can this be applied at a global scale? So what sort of costs or materials might be involved and what would it take to set something like this up? Well, this is a good question. So I think that this is actually quite um, a cheap method because um, I can reuse old vegetable oil. And magnetite powder is like a byproduct of a lot of mining and uh, a lot of um, mineral industries anyway. So uh, magnetite is actually a really cheap mineral. And uh, I've also made, made it that all the magnetite and the oil can be reused test after test, and I can separate them off using a centrifuge. So um, in fact, it would be a very small investment. And I think that even if we were not reusing the magnetite and oil, it would cost a maximum of $1.60 per thousand liters of water to, to be extracted. However, I think that if there were less plastics in that water, which could be, it could actually last longer, so it could actually be cheaper as well. So currently I make a prototype where I think probably I can do larger quantities of water. Well, and that's fantastic that you're already thinking about these things and looking at things like dollar amount per liter of filter and that it doesn't seem that bad. Um, what about selectivity? For example, does this method go for certain size plastic particles or certain compositions or types of plastic? So I tested on the 10 most commonly found microplastics in our oceans, um, which I actually con concluded from previous tests that I did. So these included polypropylene, everything to polystyrene, microbeads. I did different sizes as well. And I found that across the board, there was no statistically significant difference for the sizes, even large plastic particles, like six millimeter plastic particles, were still being extracted. And it went all the way down to one nanometer particles too. So it's quite wide for the size. However, I did find a slight difference um, in the actual, the concentration of microplastics and particularly the types of microplastics that I used. So I did find that polypropylene was not so easy to extract with only a 77% extraction rate, whereas um, washing machine fibers, anything fibrous, polyester, nylon, had an almost 95% extraction rate. Have you been, have you already started to think about if, um, patenting this technology? Have you been approached by people who want to help this get, you know, commercialized or what's, what's next with this now that you know. So I've been approached by several different companies who, who have wanted to, to, I guess, work with me and things like that. And because this is in the public domain, and because it's not patented, I think that it's great that companies can use it and can implement it, because I want it to be implemented. I don't want to make loads of money out of it. I want it just to, to be a, a use and something that people will actually use. So because of that, um, I've had quite a lot of interest from different companies and different people. However, other people are most definitely welcome. Um, and I think that over the course of this year, definitely, I'll see somebody um, using it somewhere across the world. All right. Well, and I, I think that's fantastic. And I, I certainly hope that a lot of people implement this technology as well. And it's something that really takes off. Um, <laughs> and I hope that we combine this with other strategies, such as I know there are some other technologies out there, such as essentially floating nets that will remove some of the large pieces of plastic and maybe some biodegradable plastic like yeah. materials that we can we'll see biodegradable plastics over to. And, and that's the only way that I can see this problem being abated is kind of this uh, multi-tiered solution. Um, I think even my project is not a solution. I think the solution to all of this is actually just not to use plastics whatsoever. But obviously that's not in the foreseeable future. But I think that we're all doing our bit and hopefully together we can, we can do something to combat this. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, and why don't you tell, for, for people watching, um, would you like to briefly explain the plastic pollution problem in our oceans and also freshwater mm -hmm. uh, lakes, basically all aquatic systems? I know I even saw the other day that there are high concentrations of microplastics and snow in remote regions. Um, yeah, so microplastics are just tiny plastic particles, which may have been made tiny, like microplastics in microbeads and soaps and cosmetics. 
They could also be made by when you wash your clothes, for instance, little plastic fibers come off the clothes, or it could be um, larger plastics that broke down through UV or mechanical erosion in the sea. But when these plastics enter our water courses or the air, these tiny plastic particles are really, really small. And they can actually cause a lot of problems if they get ingested by organisms. They can pass through the guts of organisms and be bioaccumulated in those organisms. Then um, larger organisms will eat the smaller organisms and those larger organisms can also bioaccumulate these plastics. And like that, they can travel through the food chain until they eventually reach us as humans. So we don't really know the extent of the problems with microplastics. However, they've definitely been linked to cancer and lots of nasty things. So it's not a very nice thing to, to um, I guess, uh, get in your food. They can travel through air, they can fly into snow in, in very remote regions, or they can also travel by water courses, and that's where they're most likely to be found. From what I understand, because once again, it's a polarity issue, they can actually concentrate similar contaminants and toxins and things in the surrounding environment to much higher levels, things that have a similar polarity as the plastic. Yeah. Actually, um, even some bacteria can grow on the surface of plastic that can otherwise not grow. So we're actually, by having plastic in our water courses, we can foster nasty bacteria, which otherwise wouldn't really be there. We're up here along the shores of Lake Ontario, and the shoreline is pretty much the same as what you hear and read about and, and see, uh, you know, along the shores of the ocean. Um, mm. So it affects basically all our uh, um, aquatic systems. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I'm extremely impressed with the technology and hearing you talk about it. Um, I think that you've probably got a solid future ahead of you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your, about your plans for the future um, beyond, say, you know, what, you're, you're going to college, it sounds like, and then do you plan to go to graduate school or do you just want to start, you know, doing some applied yeah. work or what's so it for you? So I'm going to university now first. I'm going to go to Netherlands to university mainly because, you know, what's cooler than being in a university six meters below sea level? But um, also, I just think it'll be a really good experience to go to a separate university that almost focuses on sustainable and environmental science-based issues. So I'm going to be going to the University of Groningen and studying chemistry. Now, I think that I want to keep it broad. I want to keep it very broad because I'm not quite sure what really interests me. Okay, I enjoy this project, but I've done many other projects in the past, and I think that I haven't yet honed exactly what, what I want to do. I think problem solving is something that is key in chemistry. And because of that, I just decided to, to take it as a broad subject and we'll see where it'll take me. Um, I would definitely like to pursue this project as well. Well, I'll be looking forward to seeing what you do in the future. If you were to think about somebody that has helped you along your path, I know we've all had advisors or um, you know even people that we've seen online who have motivated us. So. Mm -hmm. Who or what motivates you, uh, either an individual or, I guess, you know, a certain idea? Well, I think the idea of communicating science to the general public is something that motivates me. I really like talking about science, and I really like, I guess, problem solving and then telling other people about it. So I think one person who is a major inspiration for me anyway is Michael Faraday, who did uh, found lots of elements and, and did quite a lot of experiments, particularly in electrochemistry, where we can still see the Faraday laws to this, this day. But I think it's really inspirational to see somebody who actually um, communicated science, but also did research on the side as well. I agree. I think getting uh, scientific research out to the public is one of the most critical aspects of it. And it's something that if we overlook, uh, at the end of the day, we might just be spinning our wheels. Exactly. If you could meet anybody on earth, living or dead, who would that be? Well, that's a very difficult question. I think there's lots of people who I'd still like to meet. Um, I think, as I said, Michael Faraday would be kind of an interesting person to meet. I also am kind of a fan of David Attenborough. Like, uh, I, I like his kind of things. So um, I would also like to, to meet him sometime. Um, and then also, I think just um, anybody from the National Geographic team, I think it's another really cool science communication outlet. And I would love to, to meet the editor in chief sometime. Well, Fionn, thank you for answering my questions today. It was fantastic to hear about your technology, uh, how you came up with it, what you got going on in the future. Uh, last question for the interview. I heard that you have a minor planet named after you. Could you please tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I've got a minor planet named after me. It's called Kiln Ferreira. And that's actually from a different science fair called the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair, which I entered in 2018. There I got a second place award 
which entitles you to get a minor planet named after you. Select the uh, second and first place award winners who made a um, significant contribution to the science are selected to, um, I guess, get this amazing honor of having a minor planet. So you can only get this once in a lifetime. So sadly for me anyway, I've already got one. Um, but I think it's just a really cool honor to, to have an asteroid up there floating around with my name on it. The only problem is it could come and obliterate Earth. So when you hear asteroid Pion Ferreira coming close to Earth, you know whose fault it is. <laughs> All right. Well, we won't we won't blame you for it. <laughs> well, thanks again for talking with us today. Incredibly interesting interview, and and I do wish you the best in the future. And I know that you'll do really great things. Thank you so much. <laughs>